Turning to the livestock markets now, some livestock producers have looked to policymakers to address some of their concerns with the markets. And to that point, the U.S. House of Representatives recently voted to establish a library of cattle contracts. We visited with UNL livestock marketing economist Elliot Dennis about the cattle contract bill earlier in the week. But we began the conversation with Elliot discussing a recently House-passed extension of the livestock mandatory price reporting. And Elliot, the House of Representatives passed a bill that extends the livestock mandatory price reporting. Let's start out today's conversation reminding our viewers what LMR is. Yeah, so it's federal requirement that packers, when they purchase cattle or purchase hogs, you know, they have to report that information on. And when they sell boxes of, of meat on, that actually goes into uh, agricultural marketing service database. And that's available for all producers and people to use it. You know, it, you just Google USDA NPR, pulls up that data. Um, and really that's when we talk about sources of information of where we get price, pre-1999, all of that was voluntary price reporting. Then we had the issues in the hog market that really spurred on this, leading to that 1999 authorization of LMR, which was implemented by USDA AMS in 2001. So really important. And uh, when we talk about just information, that, that's where we primarily get our price information from. Well, you mentioned that information is available to producers. If somebody's not taking advantage of that right now, what are some ways they can do so? So, yes, first, uh, you know, it is pretty clunky to go on USDA's website. And so uh, always reaching out to uh, people like myself or people in your local area, they can help you. But also the Department of Ag Econ and myself are developing some online tools for producers that will automatically download the data and allow the you know, producers to plot that information. Those should be launching sometime in the beginning of next year. So understand that sometimes it is difficult and we're trying to make it more accessible for producers as well. Elliot also passed in the House was a bill that's targeting a cattle contract library. Tell us what that's all about. Yes, yeah, so this is similar to what's already in the hog market right now. Basically, every uh, co formula contract that's negotiated uh, has to be reported how they derived at that base price. This is, I think, a nice step for the, the livestock market or the cattle market in particular to develop something like this. And I think we can learn from what's available in the hog market and then uh, get that information. It is pretty dense. If anyone has ever seen the, the hog contract library, there's pretty much about 150 pages for the Western Corn Belt, three contracts per, per page. So I think passing that contract library is a good step uh, to provide some of that transparency, but uh, really USDA providing the resources for people like myself or other people in the industry to then translate that information that's reported into business making decision is really going to be important and we're, which is really going to help producers out the most. One of the things I want to remind our viewers is that both those bills will now head over to the Senate and we'll need the president's signature before coming into law. Let's talk about the cattle market in general now though, Elliot. Has anything caught your eye in particular as we're continuing to go through the month of December? Yeah, the biggest thing that I've been looking at is um, has been coal cow pricing. I wouldn't look at the cutter cow cutout. Um, look at typical seasonal patterns. That gives us a nice indication of kind of where the market's at. Uh, what we've seen is really prices stay elevated, and they've pretty much uh, stayed elevated since about August, when we typically see seasonal uh, declines in that. Uh, the last time this happened was in 2014, 2015. And those prices pretty much stayed elevated until uh, approximately September of the following year. I think there's a really strong indication that those prices will continue to stay elevated, at least in the cutout level, um, into next year. And I think there's actually even more pressure to, to see those potentially go up. So I'm really following that because we talk about profitability for, uh, for producers, 10 to 20 percent of income uh, is derived from marketing cold cows, so not inconsequential decision of when and, and how to market those animals. Well, Elliot, we're about ready to put 2021 in the year in the uh, rear view mirror here. As you look back at the past year, what have been some of the biggest stories that uh, strike you? Uh, change is kind of the word that comes to mind. I think there's a we've experienced a lot of change, a lot of adaptation. And you you could pretty much go into any different segment and say, wow, there was a lot of change or or variation in price that happened. And I think that's kind of the thing that I'm looking looking forward into 2022. We start to see a lot of strong signals with a herd contraction going through. And really we're talking about 
Uh, the spring for fed cattle really shaping up to be very, very strong prices because of a number of factors and also going into the fall of 2021 and the winter of 2022 being strong for feeder cattle prices too. So I think we've experienced a lot of change in 2021, but it's really put a nice kind of market fundamentals there for really, I think, strong prices going into 2022. Elliot, as always, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me.